Theresa May there. Well, we're joined now by Caroline Cox, a crossbench peer, who tomorrow introduces a bill designed to limit the influence of Sharia law in legal cases, and by the solicitor Anna Khan. Welcome to both of you. Caroline Cox, first of all, there's obviously a government review underway, so why do we need your bill? Because many, many Muslim women are in touch with me because they are suffering horrendously under the present provisions. Sharia law at the moment allows a man to divorce a wife by just saying, I divorced you three times. Polygamy is operational, and women are married into polygamous marriages. Now, knowing they're polygamous marriages, as we just heard, domestic violence is condoned because chastisement is allowed. So women are suffering. That's the urgency of the bill. Mm. But also it is a threat to that fundamental principle of one law for all in the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. Right. I mean, is Baroness Cox right to be alarmed? She is correct to be alarmed. I'm a specialist in Islamic family law, and I face um, calls like this every day from the women. So I completely agree with you that there's cause for concern, but the way that she's gone about it perhaps may not be agreed upon. Why? Because um, having legislation which I feel is not, forgive me, uh, well drafted, it's a mishmash uh, rather than a clear cut guidance, um, it seems to be trying to put the previous legislation right rather than alert us to the issues in a very clear way. Right. I don't quite understand why you're confused or you think it's a mishmash. I mean, how many Muslim women in the UK, for example, are getting married under Islamic rather than British law? My own anecdotal evidence is about 80% of marriages of the under 30s are not being registered under civil law. So I've launched my own campaign mm. about that because I'm so deeply concerned. Right. But is that not being addressed by your bill? What is being addressed by the bill is to enable women to know their rights. There was a very good report by my, my Muslim women friends in the West Midlands which showed that so many Muslim women just do not know they're being married into an Islamic marriage which doesn't give them civil rights. They don't know their rights and they yearn to know. So one of the things my bill would do be to make sure there's an obligation on statutory authorities to make sure women know their rights. That's a creed occur from those women. Right. Well, you would support that? Completely, and I would go so far as to say it should be part of the national curriculum for 15 to 17 year old boys and girls to know that they're not having any legal marital rights if they just live together because it's not just a Muslim issue people seem to think they can just live together and acquire rights. Do you agree though that Sharia law in principle is a quasi legal system which is fundamentally discriminatory against women? No I do not agree with that because I what, use what, English not? law as an English lawyer to implement Sharia law solutions. Sometimes it's the only recourse a woman has when the English law judge cannot, cannot help her. An example would be the women who are not legally married, the English law judge cannot help them and the Islamic law will give her a financial settlement which the husband has but to But would that divorce. be discriminatory, that financial settlement? Well, how would it be discriminatory if it's the only thing that the woman has to set her up after a divorce? She needs the money from her husband as a contract a written contract which she signed with him. Why can't we get that for her? The fundamental principles of Sharia law are inherently discriminatory. Inherently, a woman obtains half that of a man in a legacy. A woman's voice only counts for half that of a man in a court. Mm. Um, and the whole Sharia principles are inherently gender discriminatory in a way that make our suffragettes turn in their graves when they see them operating in Britain today. I mean, under Sharia law, a husband need only say, I divorce you three times to secure a divorce, whereas a wife must meet other conditions and pay a fee. So that mm. it is discriminatory. It's a woman's duty to know the law. So if she wants to, she should know that Islamic marriage contracts can have any clause that she wants. So she should have the right of divorce put in that and then she can give the divorce. If we go back to what used to happen 1400 years ago, which is now being done exactly the same way by Muslim men now, then we're giving away all the, our rights to them by not knowing our own rights as women. So what I would say to Muslim feminists is that we should educate Muslim women in 21st century Britain what? to ask for their Sharia law rights. What justification is there for a Sharia law to exist at all in, in terms of uh, overriding the law of this land? If English law could meet all these needs, I'd be delighted well, to say there's no need. Well, isn't that what but Baroness Cox Baroness is trying Fox, to do that? Uh, it won't meet the needs of the woman who's just living with a husband, having been duped into a marriage which she thinks is legal, and she has no legal rights to divorce, 
or a financial settlement. How would you right. help her? If you do right, away well, with Sharia let's councils, let's how will you let, help let, her? Let uh, Caroline Cox answer, and then I'll come to you, Nigel. Well, first and foremost, the bill doesn't, does respect religious freedom. If a devout Muslim accepts this discrimination in all kinds of ways, then she's entitled to do so. There's no coercion for devout Muslims or those of other faiths. It doesn't specify faith tradition. But we have thousands of Muslim women who are deeply unhappy, who are suffering at the moment from these appalling discriminations. One woman was given her divorce by the post. It came on a piece of paper to say, I divorced you. Their mom said you were divorced. She's left with no rights. She's left with no provision. So it is not a good situation for countless Muslim women in the country today. You would support Caroline Cox's... I'm uh, a huge Caroline Cox supporter. I think she's been very brave. I think she's standing up and fighting for women's rights and she's fighting for British values and she's fighting for the idea that all of us that live in this country, regardless where we come from, regardless what our religions are, have to live under one legal system. And, and everything I hear uh, is as if there is quite a large parallel society mm. developing in this country, and that's really bad news. How would you stop it? How would you, how would you end this sort of parallel legal system? It exists not just, well, of course, in the uh, Muslim community. Mm. It also exists, there are Jewish courts for ultra-Orthodox that exist, also on these sorts of civil dis sort yes, of disputes. But it, yes, but of course, you know, it is a case, ultimately, of which court you know, has supremacy, of which court is respected. And in the case of the Jewish courts, that's a method that is used to sort out disputes. Mm. But, I mean, but I mean, if 80% of marriages mm. that are going on within the I mean, Muslim it's a very large number. Are not, are, are not Forming in any way uh, with British civil law and uh, growing, th then there's something that needs to be done here in a <laughs> very, very so big way. So we all agree yeah. that we need well, to stop well, this. One of the problems, of course, is, and I know you've campaigned on this, that the British authorities over the years have very often turned a blind eye. Yes, they've turned. I mean, for example, immigration uh, coming into Britain from Pakistan, where people are coming in to take part in polygamous marriages and yet there's been knowledge of this in the foreign office in the police force and nothing's been done for fear of being seen to be racist and we need actually to be a bit more muscular in defending our values. Quick, 30 second points. One, visa brides. Women are being sent abroad forcibly to marry, to bring a husband back with a visa so he can live in this country. He will then divorce her. And secondly, polygamy. Men in these communities, my Muslim women friends tell me, many of them are having up to 20 children each with polygamous arrangements. Mm. If you don't have bigamy, this is right against the law and the spirit of our country, but also demography is going to affect democracy. All right. Well, so we all there, agree that we have to take firm action. Nigel Farage helped lead the Brexit movement, remember? And the whole world was saying, please, Britain, do not even think of leaving this Tony club. Uh, if you do, the markets will go into free fall. Briefly, very briefly, they did. And they've since rebounded. And this fear that Britain would go to hell in a handbasket, well, it hasn't materialized. That leader, Nigel Farage, is joining us right now. Nigel, the sentiment seems to be building that the world, uh, collectively, wants to see uh, a centrist candidate uh, win this thing and not Le Pen, and that everyone stays hunky-dory within the union, Britain notwithstanding, that's what they want. What do you make of that? Yeah, that's right. I mean, what the markets have done today is to back stability, continuity, and the status quo. Um, what do you think about it, though? It's irrational. I mean, what has the Eurozone done for growth? What has it done for unemployment? What has it done for global trade? Actually, the European Union itself, its single market, and its currency have been bad for business and bad for investors, but there is this scare story, and you've said it already, they were scared of Brexit, they were scared of Trump, and it was irrational, and if Marine Le Pen wins, uh, yeah, the markets will fall for a few days, but no more than that. Or, you know, some are saying that uh, populism might be waning a little bit, that maybe even just given the closeness of this election in France, maybe owing to the fact that, you know, uh, Britain's experienced a few bumps along to this official break, uh, or Donald Trump's declining popularity or, 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 or tough COVID in the polls, depending on how you look at those polls, of course, that maybe that's what's, you know, making it look long in the tooth. What do you think? No, I don't agree at all. I think what you saw in 16 was a genuine democratic revolution against the big corporate culture, against the lack of democracy, against the lack of feeling that nation states increasingly were having. Uh, look, the, the very fact that the socialists who are in power in France today got 6% in the election yesterday. The fact that the official conservative opposition didn't even make the final runoff shows you uh, that far from it disappearing, it's still there. Now, you know, Marine Le Pen uh, is, is, is not the favourite. 
over the course of the next couple of weeks. But you know something? We could be here in a couple of weeks' time after what may well be a very close contest indeed. And populism, opposition to big supranational projects is still growing. Um, finally, your thoughts on the market reaction. Now, do they interpret that, uh, you know, the union being intact uh, is better than the union not? Uh, now, that, as to your point, could change. Uh, but, but what do you make of that collective market read? Well, I'm afraid uh, that too many of the opinions uh, that the market listens to comes from the big banks who are hand in glove with the politicians and they like life just as it is. And when the, when the European Union breaks up, there may be some short-term turmoil, but ultimately people want to live in nation states, they want to vote for people that set their taxes, they want to control their borders, and ultimately that is where we're going. All right. Thank you, my friend. Always good catching up with you, Nigel Farage.